Dear Brothers and Sisters, Gender and Its Responsibility by Elder George Preface Since my late youth I sensed a social tension, which I could not clearly define, but the symptoms of which were becoming increasingly apparent. I noticed that the spirit of camaraderie among men was declining, that the media was taking an increasingly adversarial position between men and women, and that the relationship between women and women was becoming increasingly superficial. These trends were systematic of a weakening tribal and family structure, which was resulting in a growing disrespect for all forms of authority. This disrespect for authority took many forms. People no longer dressed up as a measure of respect when visiting elders or institutions. The term Mr. or Mrs. was dropped, and the first name was used in all forms of address. Professional athletes discontinued allegiance to teams and became free agents. Corporate loyalty gave way to individual gain, and job changes increased. The police were no longer held in high esteem. Universities were burned, and presidents from both political parties were in disrepute. Disco dancing replaced ballroom dancing as an expression of women becoming independent of the leadership of men. The elders left the tribe and went to live in retirement communities. Wives sought out-of-the-home employment and independent careers. The rate of divorce increased, and children were put in nursery schools. Traditional activities no longer seemed to work. The family that prayed together did not necessarily stay together. Church-going children OD'd on drugs, as did non-church-going children. The clergy could not hold families together because their own families were disintegrating. A priest would run off with a married woman. A minister would run off with the organist, and the organist was a man, and the rabbi would have a Buddhist mistress. Psychiatrists, psychologists, and therapists were also having an increased incident of divorce, as were all professional people. All types of standards were deteriorating and disappearing. Morality and ethics were so disluted as to be non-existent. What used to be gutter language became modern syntax. A man's word being his bond gave way to a phrase, so I lied, and it was used on programming of every major network. Having a hooker visit one's home was also a requirement on all TV programs, and they all seemed to be doing quite well in their professions, a point that was not missed by young, impressionable girls watching these shows. Adultery, incest, pornography, and general lasciviousness became standard fare on home television. The First Amendment was used as a vehicle to reduce the influence of teaching of the Torah, Bible, Quran, Teo, Upanishads, and the Confucius of the Buddha. Dishonesty became the norm in social relations. A school marm of one room schoolhouse had given our children a better education than the high tech school environments that were developing. The manner in which education was handled became symbolic of society's solution to all problems. Just throw money at it. The more we spent on education, the less our children were learning. The more we spent on society, the more the fabric of society seemed to be unraveling. Yet the idea that money was the solution to all ills became pervasive, bringing about the worst practice of democratic government, the election of government officials on the basis of how much government money they could bring into our locale. Everyone was on the take. Spend, spend, spend was the requirement of government office. People were not worried about the budget or fiscal policy. They just wanted more of everything. The disappearance of standards resulted in a doing one thing philosophy, which evolved into narcissism. All self-help activities, whether religious, spiritual, mental, physical, emotional, or psychological, were imbued with the glorification of self, rather than the motivation of serving others. Religious doctrine became bastardized, and the legitimacy and authenticity of spiritual teachings became suspect. Bacchanalan lifestyles flourished as the thirst for pleasure became insatiable. Drug language of all sorts became de rigueur. We were the richest nation in the world, yet poverty was spreading. We were the freest nation in the world, yet we could not build prisons fast enough to house all the convicts. We were the most religious-oriented industrial nation, 
Yet immorality was rampant. Something fundamental was obviously wrong, but what? I wrote letters to TV programs, directors, editors, and various organizations, calling for the need to restore family values. Yet I myself became a victim, or a participant, in the general deterioration of social structure and values, having gone through a divorce and seen my family dispersed. What was happening in and to America? What? 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 I noticed that creativity, or at least the results of creative and especially conceptual thinking, were on a severe decline. Every conceptual invention that was within the common knowledge of society occurred in the first half of the century. The automobile, airplane, phonograph, motion picture projector, radio, television, rocketry, atomic power, radar, sonar, computer, and even transistor were all invented before 1950. With a tremendous increase in college education and scientific knowledge in the last half of the 20th century, why was conceptual thinking on the decline? With the hundreds of billions of dollars spent on the great society, why was poverty on the increase? Why, concurrent with the great society, are men being put into cages at an ever-increasing rate? Why, with the great emphasis on relationship in schools, on TV, radio, and printed media, new age philosophy, and in self-help organizations, were there fewer marriages, more rapes, more sexual harassment, and a general inability to make commitments? Why have the values of women changed? from wanting to be desired not only for their bodies, but for their hearts and minds as well, to give only their bodies, but not their hearts and minds? Why do they, on a subconscious level, increasingly seek out these men who won't make commitments? Why were men being called stupid for having large families, when there was a time that they were admired for doing so? Why did husbands and wives stop understanding each other's weaknesses and idiosyncrasies, why with the new emphasis on relationships where we told, don't put up with him or don't put up with her, the more we were talking about relationships, the less we were having them. Yet people were just as good as they ever were. The world was still on its upward path of spiritual evolvement. Why weren't we getting along? Why had we run away from all the institutions that normally provided people comfort? I can remember in my youth the warmth and security that emanated from the family structure, women visiting in the kitchen discussing the issues important to them, men visiting in the living room discussing the issues important to them. Life was full of tribal activities, weddings, funerals, baptisms, bar mitzvahs, and confirmations. If one of the men of the tribe was not treating his wife properly, the other men would pay him a visit and tell him how the men of their tribe take care of their women, and he would usually alter his behavior. If a woman was not treating her husband properly, some old grandmother would pay her a visit and explain how the women of the tribe treat their men, and she would usually adjust her behavior. There was always some old auntie somewhere who was doing her part to hold the tribe together, to introduce single people to each other, to give advice and consolation. A clergy were usually part of tribal activities, and the minister, priests, and rabbis were invited to most of the important familial and tribal functions. Even the local doctor and school teacher were invited to these functions, for they took care and educated the tribe. If there was a secure nest, the tribal structure was it. If there was safety, a sense of belonging and knowing that you were cared for, it was in the presence of the tribe. Yet most tribal structures have disappeared with hardly a vestige remaining. These tribal structures were based on ethnicity, religion, and race. And as intermarriage between various ethnic, racial, and religious groups increased, society became more homogeneous, and the clear defined lines of these cultures began to blur, fade, and eventually disappear. This was natural. What was unnatural was the lack of development of new tribal cultures to replace the old. And I realized that therein was the major cause of the social problem that were developing. However, while I did realize that new tribal structure were not forming, I did not know the reason, nor did I fully comprehend the effect that the lack of these tribal structures was having on the nation. I did notice that the relationship between men and women was becoming strained. This was a puzzling experience for me as I had an excellent social life with the opposite sex that began in grade school 
and consisted of going to house parties, dances, roller skating, beach parties, church, and school events, the movies, nightclub, and a multitude of other activities. Ever since my teen years, the opposite sex had confided in me, whether friends, acquaintances, or complete strangers, whom I would meet on the train, bus, subway, plane, and hotels, and at business conventions. They would sit next to me and voluntarily share the most intimate details of their lives. I learned a lot about women in this manner, and not a small amount of the information contained in this book came from these experiences. Nevertheless, I too began to feel a strained relationship with women. This occurred not in the social realm, but in the functional realm of society. I noticed that at business meetings, PTA meetings, church council meetings, and other social functions, I was not comfortable with the increased involvement of women. Apparently, many men weren't either, for articles were written that when women learned a particular function that had been in the domain of men, the men would stop participating in that function. When women started ushering in church, fewer men volunteered to usher. When women started appearing on the church council, it became more difficult to find men to, to volunteer for the council. This decreased participation in males was occurring in all sorts of organizations and even in universities that had gone from single-sex education to co-education. What was the reason for this phenomenon? I felt that the passing of the tribal structure and the discomfort and the antagonism developing between the sexes were related, but I wasn't sure how. I did realize that men and women saw life differently, thought differently, and acted differently, that I could not clearly define these differences, nor could I determine to what degree they affected the functional realm of our activities. Like many people, I knew something was wrong. I also knew that somehow it was related to our differences in gender, and that this difference had to be acknowledged and recognized. Sitting in my living room one day and reflecting on all of the foregoing, I prayed for guidance to find a cause and solution to these issues that seriously affected all of us. Shortly thereafter, I came upon a book entitled Kybalion, which contains the teachings of Hermes Trimestius, one of the earliest influences on philosophical and spiritual thinking. In reviewing the index of the, the Kybalion, I noticed one chapter entitled Gender and another Mental Gender. Here at last was a missing link of information that I needed to finally put the bow on the string around my package of cause, effect, and solution to the issue affecting society. I felt like a modern-day Archimedes who, after learning that a floating body displaced its weight in water, ran through the streets of Athens shouting, Eureka, which means I found it. I sure felt as though I had found it, for in the Kybalion, the principle of gender was defined. It was more than just a difference between the sexes. It was a principle that explained the operation of the entire universe, and on the human society as well. After reading the Kybalion, I reviewed various religious texts and saw in all of them the underlying principle of gender. I also observed that all the activities of modern society were gender-influenced, whether government or economy, education or religion. I have explained in this book, through a compilation of essays, the issues affecting us today as they relate to the universal principle of gender and the appropriate action to be taken to resolve these issues. If you agree with what is written therein, then we can individually and collectively work to bring about the changes that will once again bring stability and relative harmony to our society and enable us more readily pursue the spiritual growth that is the purpose of our earthly existence. I send my love to all of you. Chapter 1 Dear Brothers and Sisters Dear Brothers and Sisters, please think of this book as a letter addressing an influence which began early in the 20th century that has caused many changes in our lives. Each era had issues needing resolution in order for society to keep on its forward evolutionary path, and we too have issues that need resolving. The issue unique to our era 
is that the importance of gender has been obscured as a result of our involvement in the industrial and post-industrial economy. We are serving the means of production rather than having it serve us. This serving of the economy has altered our relationships to one another, to God, and to institutions, and has caused chaos and dissidence in our society. We all know that the hammer is a tool, and that after we have finished hammering nails into a board, we can put the hammer back in the toolbox where it has no influence over us. We are the masters, and the hammer is our servant. This has also been true of our relationship to the plow over the centuries. It was used to till the field in order to obtain the product used to nurture the race. We did not serve the plow, it served us. As long as we knew that we were masters of the plow, we had a better perspective of our relationship to God and to one another. We knew that we were spiritual beings residing in material bodies. We knew that in our present stage of development, we could only grow spiritually in these material bodies, and therefore the highest material calling was the propagation and the preservation of the race, the proper balance of gender, which is the basis of all existence, and which we knew to exist subjectively, and which was part of our inherent natures, accomplished this. The natural means of providing goods and services necessary for the propagation and the preservation of the race has latterly been defined as capitalism. The above are the basic tenets of the viewpoints that will be expounded upon in this book. Our departure from these tenets is the underlying cause of the issues that are troubling society, such as the breakdown of the familial and tribal order, which has created a void that the state continually tries to fill. The laws, custom, and traditions created for the well-being of the race have come into disrepute, and the religious doctrine has become bastardized. Crime, rape, lying, cheating, adultery, unwed motherhood, venereal disease, and child abuse have all increased. The life expectancy of women in relationship to that of men has decreased because of various forms of substance abuse. Academic standards and the performance have deteriorated, as have reportorial standards in all media and ethical standards in all professions. Respect has declined for all authority, be it person or institutions. We have the highest incarceration rate in the world and the highest murder rate of any industrial nation. The state has taken over more and more of the natural masculine role of the family, setting standards for morality, actually removing them, child rearing and the care of the aged, and the family income distribution. The more the state has replaced the masculine role, the more chaos has spread. The state is enacting laws that emasculate men and the economic arena similar to that done by men in the home, resulting in a decrease in daring the pioneering spirit, the creativity, with the resultant stagnation of the economy. Social stability and the economic growth can only be achieved by the return to the natural general base society. With the creative will and the pioneering spirit of the masculine gender is combined with the nurturing, loving manifestation of the feminine gender, the race will most readily propagate and preserve itself on its journey towards spiritual growth. Rather than attempt to prove these assertions by a critical and objective presentation of supporting data, as is the norm with most authors in the Western scientifically oriented society, I am instead using the approach of expressing my own views regarding the interpretation of data, as was used by Plato, Kant, Marx, and others. Some of my assertions may prove to be erroneous, but others who believe in my basic philosophy come to the fore and supply the necessary proof, and will also push forward the knowledge of this particular subject. Also, we believe in our perceptions, not in proofs. John Keats wrote in a letter to a friend, Nothing in this world is provable. And Emmeline Carter said, We prove what we want to prove. Let the test of the assertions made in this letter be, Does it sound true to me? If it does, then it is true to you. If it doesn't sound true to you, then it isn't. All true knowledge is subjective. We just use 
our objectivity to gather information to support the subjective beliefs that we already have. Having said this, it is my hope that the contents of this letter will ring true to you. My hope is not only that the information contained in this book will ring true to you, but that you will feel it, that it will cause you to have a wide range of emotions, and that you will do something to bring forth change. The time for action is nearing. How much longer can we stand by and let the race deteriorate? How much longer can we stand by and watch our brothers and sisters suffer? I hope that your answer will be not any longer, and that your actions will confirm your words. A statement of the principles governing my assertions will be repeated throughout this book and are as follows. 1. Humankind is spirit in a material body. All else is religious theory. The highest material purpose is the propagation and preservation of the race. All else is anthropological theory. 3. The manner in which humankind's spiritual and material objects are obtained is determined upon the balance of gender. All else is sociological theory. 4. Capitalism is a natural distribution of goods and services. All else is economic theory. I thank you for having started to read this book and hope that its contents will sufficiently interest you so that you will continue reading until the end, whereupon you will be motivated to partake in a movement that will bring about the betterment of the human race. Chapter 2. Basic Characteristics of Gender This chapter identifies the basic attributes of gender. References to gender attributes begin with the ancients and are found in the earliest religious and mystical teachings and in various culture, science, and arts. For New Age knowledge, enthusiasts, numerology, and astrology both contain references to gender. The forces of gender act throughout the universe and the universe itself cannot exist without the influence of gender. The creating, producing, and generating of manifestations on every plane of existence is the result of gender. As there is an anode and cathode in an electrical storage battery, the attraction to each other causes the flow of electricity. There is also an anode and cathode inf influence in all life. The cathode is the feminine, mother principle, of electrical phenomenon and of life. The feminine mother principle is the one doing the productive and creative work. The anode is the masculine, the father principle, which is that of will, the directing and willing of energy towards the feminine principle, enabling it to create. This union of the masculine and feminine principles is evident in the procreation of the race. The masculine principle of will becomes imbued in the nurturing feminine principle, enabling it to do its creative work, the creation of the child. In the mental realm, the masculine principle is the objective, conscious, and voluntary mind. The feminine principle is the subjective, subconscious, and involuntary passive mind. The I represents the masculine principle of gender. It contains the will that motivates the me. The me represents the feminine principle of gender. It contains the thoughts, feelings, and the emotions of the self. That requires the direction of the I in order to produce and accomplish. The tendency of the feminine principle is to receive impressions. The tendency of the masculine principle is to give out, to express, to make impressions. In order to better understand the effects of gender influence on government, economics, and society in general, it is best to first consider the positive and the negative manifestations of each gender. The positive manifestations of the masculine gender are individuality, originality, creativity, ambition, courage, independence, discipline, progressiveness, positiveness, self-sufficiency, leadership, daring, activeness, force, willpower, stability, constancy, pioneering spirit, Abstract thinking, conditional love, contemplation. The negative manifestations of the masculine gender are selfishness, laziness, insensitivity, stubbornness, imitation, dependency. The extremes of the masculine gender are brutality and tyranny. The positive manifestations of the feminine gender are 
cooperation, diplomacy, companionship, genility, consideration, unconditional love, harmony, friendliness, rhythm, receptivity, nurturing, caring, giving, industriousness, materialism, visual thinking, and accommodation. The negative manifestations of the feminine gender are vacillation, apathy, indifference, deceitfulness, carelessness, disloyalty, spinelessness. The extremes of the feminine gender are cruelty, deception, and chaos. Every human being has within them the attributes of both genders, but each sex will manifest most strongly those gender attributes that are associated with their specific sex. The mind and the body are interrelated and codependent. Our thinking and our plumbing work together. Chapter 3. Gender in the Godhead The universe is dependent on gender for its existence, and since the universe is God's creation, within the Godhead there resides the seed for both the masculine gender principle and the feminine gender principle. In the Kybalian Trismegistus, one of the earliest influences on spiritual and philosophical thought, states that the I of our personalities is the creative will of the masculine gender, and the M, or me, is a nurturing and productive feminine gender. When Moses asked how God was to be called, the response recorded in Exodus 3.14 is, I am the I am. We can interpret this as, I am the masculine and the feminine gender. There is no existence without gender. Therefore, to say, I am the masculine and the feminine gender, is to say, I am all that there is. Another biblical interpretation of Exodus 3.14 is that God's answer to Moses was, I am becoming. This is also correct. The I is the unchangeable will of God, which is the masculine principle. The universe is the plastic, palpable, changing, feminine principle. However, God is not changing. God is the unchangeable I. What God has created is changing. That is what is becoming. That is the feminine principle of the gender. The biblical allegory of women being created from the rib of a man is a colloquial explanation of the mythical truth that before a universe existed, there was no need for gender. There was only the will of God, which is the masculine principle. When the universe was created, so was the need for gender, and thus the feminine principle of existence became into being. The masculine concept of the universe is that it is the mental projection of God. All is mind, it is a mystical axiom and a manifestation of the masculine gender. However, the mind is cold and life does not exist in the cold. It exists in warmth. That warmth is provided by the nurturing love of the feminine gender. There is no electricity, magnetism, gravity, heat, and no anything without gender. Jesus gave many examples of the masculine and the feminine gender principles. In the story of the woman taken in adultery, he said, Let he that has not sinned cast the first stone. This was the forgiving feminine gender aspect of God. He also said at the same time to the same woman, Go and sin no more. This was the demanding, standard-setting, masculine gender aspect of God. The story of the master who forgave the debts of his servant contains both the forgiving and the retributive nature of God. In Oriental philosophy, reference is made to the yin and the yang of the universe, the yang being the active positive masculine force and the yin being the passive negative female force. It is not foolish to argue over the gender of God when it is obvious that both genders emanate from God. The terms Mother Earth and the Father in Heaven are used because the earth represents the unearned love of mother who feeds us all regardless of whether we are good or bad, and the earned love of father who tells us that if we abuse mother, we will be punished. These terms are not to mean that the earth is mother and God is father, but rather that they represent the masculine and the feminine aspect of God. God is as each person perceives God to be. Whether we call upon God as the Holy Father or the Divine Mother, we are speaking to the same deity. In the first half of the 20th century, it was the masculine, gender-based, retributive, and punitive perception 
of God that predominated in our worship, with the resilient guilt-induced feelings, the suffocative effect of, on society. In the last half of the 20th century, it has been the feminine gender-based forgiving perception of God that has predominated in our worship, with the resultant anything-goes, do-your-own-thing chaotic effect on society. When there is an imbalance of gender anywhere, in anything, in any organization, in any grouping of any life form, it will have a detrimental effect. Equanimity can only occur when there is a balance in the manifestation of masculine and feminine gender. Chapter 4. The Trinity of Accomplishment Most major religions refer to the principle of the Trinity. One manifestation of this principle is our accomplishments. In order for anything to be accomplished, there are three requirements. The will to do, which is a manifestation of the masculine gender, the creating and the producing, which is the feminine gender, and the medium through which accomplishment can manifest, which is called substance or matter. The nature of all principles is that they are absolute and complete. There are no shadings or degree in a principle. Two and two is always four. It is never almost four or roughly four, the acceleration of a falling body due to gravity, 32 feet per second second, not usually, or most of the time, but always. A moving body keeps moving unless there is something to stop it, always. A stationary body stays stationary unless there is something to move it, always. In the universal principle of gender, there is no such condition of mostly feminine or mostly masculine. The principle at work is purely masculine or purely feminine, all of the time. Some illustrations of the principle of gender at work and the resultant manifestation below. Masculine assertive. Anode. Sun. North Pole. Sperm. Farmer. Bull. Force. Feminine receptive. Cathode. Moon. South Pole. Ova. Earth. Cow. Stillness. Manifestation. Electricity. Light at night. Magnetism, child, fruit and vegetables, milk, movement. Masculine assertive, force, mind, goals, God's will, feminine receptive, movement, law, work, human acceptance. Manifestation, stillness, order, accomplishment, spiritual attainment. In all of the illustrations, the acceptance, receptivity, and compliance of the feminine gender are total and without evocation. The moon has no choice in reflecting the light of the sun. The ovum has no choice as to which sperm will be impregnated in it. The earth has no choice as to the plants it will grow. Human beings have no choice as to the will of God. The power of the masculine gender is also total and unequivocal. The seeds were planted in the earth. The sun shone on the moon. Forest was applied to the moving and stationary objects. There was no degree of application, just application. The gender principle is also at work within each person, and each person has access to all the attributes of both genders. However, the nature of our bodies determines which attributes enable it to best function in harmony. The body contains the receptive ova, the nurturing breasts, the smaller, more delicate structure, draws unto it the feminine gender attributes, the body that is broad at the shoulders and more muscular, and that generates that will impregnate the ova, will draw into it the masculine gender attributes. Even though each body has access to all the gender attributes, those that assist and promote the harmony of the particular body will prevail. To say that the only difference between a man and a woman are the organs of sex is akin to saying that the only difference between a giraffe and a rabbit is the size of the neck. The difference in the neck size affects the thinking, psyche, and the activities of these animals. It affects where they eat, how they eat, how they defend themselves, and the color of their skin. Their entire lives are different because of the differences in the size of their necks. The difference in neck size is not nearly as different as the difference in gender attributes. As Emmanuel Seller, former congressman of Brooklyn, said many years ago, there is less difference between a chestnut horse and a horse chestnut than between a man and a woman. Congressman Seller was stating in colloquial terms that the universal principle of gender, we have been taught that the 
the one-celled form of life reproduces itself a fact that seemingly negates the principle of gender. This past year, a notation in a magazine stated that scientists had discovered what appears to be gender in the amoeba. Of course there is gender in the production of the amoeba. Nothing is produced in our universe without the influence of gender. It cannot be otherwise. The masculine gender wills the feminine gender produces. Nothing begins until the masculine gender wills it, and nothing is accomplished until the feminine gender produces it. Working in harmony together through the medium of substance, they create and produce all that is. It can be called the trinity of accomplishment. Chapter 5 Gender Relationships in the Animal World The societal structure of the animal kingdom is based on gender. The characteristics attributable to gender define the function of the individual member of the grouping. These characteristics are the same for animals as for humans, for the attributes of gender are universal, whether they apply to animals, humans, societies, or organizations. A species of the animal kingdom in which the gender roles are clearly defined and which gender differences are pronounced is the lion. The role of the male lion is to determine the territory where the predator live, taking into consideration the access to food and water and its relative position to other prides. Once the territory has been determined and been made known to the lions of the pride and outside the pride, the lioness then does the hunting and the child rearing. Not only does she do the hunting, but once the kill is made, she and the cubs wait until the lion comes to pick out the choice parts for himself before they eat. The male lion assumes other aspects of government such as the acceptance of new lionesses and her cubs or her unborn into the pride. If the male do not recognize her scent, her unborn cubs will be killed, for only the offspring of the males of the pride are permitted to survive. If the female recognizes her scent, they will assist in the feeding of her cubs. The functioning of a pride of lions is based on tribal society in which gender determines the roles of its members. We see in the male lion the attributes associated with the masculine gender such as creativity, determining the location of the pride to live, pioneering, moving the pride to the new location, courage, indicating to lions outside the pride the extent of the territory to be occupied by the pride, governance, determining the eligibility of members of the pride. In the lioness we see the attributes associated with the manifestation of the feminine gender, nurturing, catering to the cubs and the lion, industriousness, doing the hunting, cooperation, assisting other lionesses with the feeding of their offspring, adaptability, catering to the new males that take over the leadership of the pride because they are stronger than the previous males. There are those who do not appreciate the comparison of human behavior to that of animal behavior, the feeling being that we are far advanced from the animals. We aren't the following paragraph describes a human situation in which the expected behavior was very similar to that of the lions. A strong, modern, liberated woman in her early thirties and employed in the film industry, and I met for cocktails to discuss a film script for which I was seeking the financing necessary to have it produced into a movie. During this meeting, she suggested that we become partners, which was surprising to me, for we only knew each other casually before this meeting. She indicated to me that the film industry was a very competitive business that requires most ruthless negotiations. She felt that I had good business acumen and that I was capable of dealing with the toughest negotiators. She had experience in all the different facets of film production and felt that if I were to negotiate profitable deals with the film distributors, she would handle the productive end. She said, you cut the deal and I'll do all the work. As I sat across the table and looked at her, I realized that she asked me to be the lion and offered to be the lioness. This event was not unusual. It was natural and similar event occurs every day between men and women. It is because of its naturalness that we tend not to notice it, but our gender characteristics are an innate part of our nature. A more elaborate form of societal structure than that of the lions exists among baboons which have a highly organized patriarchal societal structure called a troop. The members of the troop are subservient to the male leader who has a harem, and those dietic and sexual demands are catered to. This is a societal structure similar 
to most of the non-European world prior to the age of industrialization. One of the most interesting characteristics of the troop is that the young adolescent males are encouraged to challenge the older, larger males. After a few encounters of this sort, in which the young males end up being buffeted about by the older, stronger males, they learn who the biggest and meanest baboons are, and then behave in a more subdued fashion, carrying out their respective roles in their support of a troop. Wouldn't it be equally beneficial if retired football players, instead of being hired by food companies to screw lids on jams and pickle jars, spent time with their adolescent youth, and when the occasion required it, let them know who was strongest and the meanest baboons were? There is no form of organization, be it a pride or troop, family, tribe, or nation, that can long endure without the governance of the masculine gender. Leadership, rulership, governance, and masculine gender functions. To have it otherwise is to court disaster. This disaster occurred in the economic sense in Eastern Europe and has occurred in the societal sense in America. Chapter 6 I taught Sunday school to a group of teenage boys and girls who were in grades 9 through 11, came from upper middle class homes, and were getting an above average education. One Sunday, I gave them an assignment to observe the personal anxieties, hurts, aggravations, disappointments, and irritations of, of people and report on their observations the following Sunday. When we met again the following week, the girls reported a multitude of events, a passenger arguing with the bus driver, a teacher aggravated by a student, parents having an argument, a girlfriend upset because she thought her boyfriend was dating someone else, a neighbor worried about the possible result of mes medical tests, a neighbor whose employer might relocate worried about his job. On and on their reporting went, with what appeared to be a limitless number of observations. The boys had nothing to report. Nothing. I pressured them and asked if there wasn't anything that happened that was contrary to what they had hoped for or expected. Again, nothing. Finally, one of the boys raised his hand, and his wrinkled brow, giving evidence of deep thought, said, The Mets lost. On another occasion, I decided to inquire as to their feelings towards the opposite sex, and had girls only on one Sunday and boys only on the other Sunday. In this session, which only the girls attended, I asked them why they went out with boys. The girls indicated that they eventually wanted to get married and that going out with boys gave them an opportunity to determine if these boys would be a good prospective mates. I asked what they used as a measure of the boys' qualifications for being a husband, and they indicated that comparing them to their fathers was a starting point. The girls knew why they were going out with boys, and what kind of boys they preferred to go out with, how they expected them to behave, and what the final result would be. The following week, I asked the boys why they went out with girls. Silence was the answer to my question. I asked again and again, and I was answered with silence. I indicated that I knew that they went out with girls because I had seen them with girls. I again asked why they went out with girls. Finally, one of the boys said that he goes out with girls when the other guys are going to a place where they bring girls. I then posed the question, when you bring a girl to a place or party where the other guys bring girls, what traits do you like to see in that girl? Silence. Finally, after considerable probing, the same fellow who had expressed disappointment that the Mets had lost raised his hand, and again, his wrinkled brow giving evidence a deep thought. I presume he was a class intellectual, said that if he had to bring a girl on a date because the other guys were bringing one, then he wanted the one that wasn't jerky. I asked the other boys if that was the kind of girl they wanted to go out with, one that wasn't jerky. And they all agreed. At that point, I realized any further discussion on the opposite sex would be a futile, as perhaps all the dis past discussions had been, and moved on to a new subject. It was obvious that the girls were more mature than the boys. They knew that they were women, and were already attuned to the physical, social, and material world that was a manifestation of the feminine gender. However, the boys were already were ahead of the girls in conceptual understanding, which is a manifestation of the masculine gender. When the boys would discuss the Big Bang Theory 
of creation of the universe or the theory of black holes in space, the girls thought the boys were silly. Visual thinking, that is, thoughts that have size, form, and color, were well manifested in the girls, whereas abstract thinking was already very evident with the boys. As we see in the following chapter, each sex has already developed the thinking necessary for them to accomplish their primary functions. As far as the girls maturing earlier than the boys, in all species of life, the superior intelligence always matures more slowly. Chapter 7. The Physical Female A woman's life is physical. The emotions she has are the result of physical thoughts and experiences. Her life resolves around her feminineness, and that feminineness is physical. The primary difference between a woman and a man is that a woman is equipped mentally, physically, and psychologically for childbearing and nurturing. This ability and all that it entails is not a collateral function, but the primary attributes of her being, and all else is collateral. This is true whether or not she has children, for it is her nurturing ability that fuels the race. Childbearing to a man is a concept, either instinctively or objectively. He realizes that the race must be propagated, or that he and or his wife want a child. His will, his creative will, impregnated via his sperm into the nurturing female body and entering the ova, begins the process of propagation. Once the brief period required for the depositing of the sperm into the female has passed, the physical involvement of the male in the procreation of the race is ended. It is the nurturing female aspect that will produce what the creative will of the male has implanted. This nurturing is not a concept, but a highly physical process. From the moment of conceptualization, the female begins to change physically. Ovulation stops. She gains weight. Her body goes through an almost infinite number of changes. She gives birth. Her breasts swell. She feeds her child. There is nothing abstract about this process. It is all physical and experience as exists. And this physical experience includes her surroundings, for she wants a safe, secure shelter, nest with the abundance of things necessary for her to nurture her child. It is said, women go where the money is. This is indirectly true. Women go to the material source that will provide the nest they desire. A cave woman sought out the caveman who wielded the biggest club, who had the biggest and safest cave, and who could provide the most food. The female eagle mates with the male, who has the largest wing spread, who can fly the fastest and farthest, who can build the most secure nest and protected well. In the animal kingdom, if the females are not seeking out the strongest male, then it is the strongest males who are gathering up the females. But in either case, the offspring are being raised in the best material environment available. Amongst humans of this age, matters material are obtained with money. Therefore, the modern woman, when seeking the man who can provide her with the material environment that she is accustomed to or desires, mates with the most moneyed man she can get, who is compatible with her personality and other desires. In that sense, women go where the money is. There is nothing wrong with this concept, provided that once the agreement of mate is reached, the woman maintains a relationship of loyal and fidelity. Women seek to be with powerful men. This is as instinctive an action as mating itself, for it has its roots in the mating urge. It is assumed that the most powerful men will provide the most secure nest and abundant environment. The purpose of material things is to nurture the race, and it is the manifestation of the feminine gender that is concerned with this nurturing. A woman's life evolves around her being a female, and this too is a material condition. From the age when menstruation begins until the age when it ends, 20% of the days of a woman's life are attended to that function. If she experiences premenstruation syndrome, this figure may increase to 30%. To this can be added the time that she is concerned that her cycle is early, late, or stopped. The time spent on checking to determine if she's pregnant, why she isn't pregnant, and just being and just being pregnant, the time spent on having her uterus and ovaries examined, the time spent on investigating various vaginal discharges, the time spent on mammary examinations, the time spent on various female surgical procedures, 
such as the removal of polyps, hysterectomies, and breast removals, on the occasion that there is no menstrual cycle or concerns with any aspect of it, that there are no health problems, that there is a regular day, if such exists, then she can be sure there will be a number of males around who would like to reach these parts that require her attention, and other parts as well. This creates another area of physical concern for the woman, the desirability of her body, as determined by men. She therefore becomes concerned with the shape of her legs, hips, stomach, buttocks, and bust, and spends considerable time doing what she can to make herself as desirable as possible. A woman's life resolves around her being a female, and the physical world that attends to her female necessities and responsibilities. This physical nature of woman has its effects on businesses and the economy, and is, in fact, the basis for economics. The money spent on television advertising for products relating directly to the feminine requirements exclusive of cosmetic needs is in the hundreds of millions of dollars annually. Products for feminine hygiene consist of tampons, pads, douches, are advertised on every TV channel, as are products related to the feminine cycle, such as medication for menstrual cramps, bloating, premenstrual syndrome, pregnancy tests, calcium supplements to combat osteoporosis, mammary gland inspection services, medication for the now and seemingly ubiquitous yeast infections, are all products and services that exist to serve the feminine requirements of women. Is there even one product advertised on television that has to do with the male requirement of men? The servicing of the female requirements of women is a multi-billion dollar industry of physical products. The durable goods industry, which serves as one of the parameters of business activity, is actually an industry that serves the nurturing requirements of women. Are not products such as refrigerators, dishwashers, toasters, clothes washers and dryers, vacuum cleaners, blenders and stoves, all vehicles that enable a woman to nurture the race? Is not every product manuf manufactured and advertised for the nurturing of the race? Even the automobile, the primary purpose of which was to enable men to produce the products necessary for nurturing, has become a vehicle used by women to go about the process of obtaining the goods necessary for the nurturing of the race. The basis of economic commerce business is the production of goods and services for the nurturing requirements of the race as performed by women but are the results of the abstract thinking and creative will of men. The proliferation of female writers of books, articles, and manuals on various self-help subjects have taken the world abundant from the Bible and enshrined it. We hear in lectures and read in books and magazines and see on public access as television pronouncements about the abundant life the Lord has destined for us. We are encouraged to spend freely, change a lot for for our charge a lot for our services, and in general to enjoy the abundant life. Contrast this penchant for matters material with the life of men, whether they be warriors, justists, adventurers, or scientists who are admonished to live a life without thought of material gain. Is it any wonder, then, that women think physically that their thoughts are mental pictures that have form, size, and color? whereas the thoughts of men are abstract and conceptual in nature? As we shall see in the next chapter, it is this abstract conceptual thinking coupled with the creative will of men creates and produces the products necessary for nurturing the race. Chapter 8. The Non-Physical Male Men are taller, broader at the shoulders, narrower at the hips, more muscular, heavier and stronger, on the average than the woman. It could be said that since men have the physical advantage over women, it is the men who are very physical beings. As support for this viewpoint, it can be shown that males indulge in highly physical sport activities such as football, boxing, rugby, and wrestling. Males also excel in the non-physical recreational activities such as chess, checkers, bridge, and other card games. A man's thinking is conceptual. The physical prowess that he has enabled him to implement the product of his conceptual thinking. During the evolution of the race, while the females were involved in childbearing and child-rearing, the conceptual thinking of the males regarded how to provide 
for the preservation of the race required considerable physical prowess in order for the results of that thinking to be implemented. Stanima, endurance, and strength were required to climb mountains, cross rivers, develop new paths through forests and jungles, and defend against predator animals and unfriendly tribes. These activities, which required tremendous physical ability to accomplish, were the implication of the creative will. This creativity resulted in the abstract non-physical thinking that determined new paths to take, new sources of food, different methods of production, inventions, and their creative development, all of which benefited the race. The physical thinking of women, the thinking in terms of form, size, and color, are anti theical of creativity. The concept has no form or size. Bell did not know that the telephone would look like, nor did Edison know what the phonograph would look like. Indeed, the form, size, and color of these inventions were changed shortly after they were invented. The prerequisite of inventions are not education and credentials. They are the exercise of the creative will of the masculine gender. It is the continually de diminishing influence of the masculine gender that is causing the relative decrease in the inventiveness in the last half of the century. During the same period, the number of women graduates in engineering and the science has increased exponentially, yet their presence in the patent office is almost non-existent. Physical thinking does not create, it nurtures. Abstract thinking creates, abstract thinking conceives. The abstract thinking and the conceptualization of the masculine gender, coupled with its creative will, produces the inventiveness that provides the product and the services for the nurturing of the race.